according to Amos uh, 6, chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, it says here, You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. God's grace be upon us continually because of the reading of the word. I want you to think, pause and think of that one thing that when it is taken away from you will make you devastated. Is it relationship? Is it possession? Or a certain situation in your life? Is it your traditions? Probably. Or maybe a skill of an or an ability to do something. You, know, you lose your skills in designing a software, probably. But due to illness or an accident, you know, you're very good at something and then there's an accident that happens. You, you know, you remember that name, Johnny Erickson Paga? Yeah. yeah. Well, she lost, she became a quadriplegic, right? Because of an accident. What about your job? That you thought you'd have the rest, you, you, you'll have for the rest of your life. Is it more important to you than God? You need to consider how tight to hold whatever it is actually has on you because it could become counterproductive and it could even be dangerous. So how would you react if God said, give it up? Give it up. Today we'll talk about principle number 19. And it says, you will lose anything you hold too tightly. Anything that you hold too tight, you lose it. I'm giving this message because we need to always be reminded that there's nothing in this world that can replace God in our lives. Nothing in this world. I'm saying this again can replace God in our lives. There's nothing in this world that can replace our relationship with God. And we don't want to be numbed by the commercialization of this world. We don't want these material things, no matter how awesome or how cool it is to own these things. You know, you have a top-down <coughs> convertible drive, you know, with your hair in the wind. I don't have that, but if you did, you know, it's awesome. You're driving a two-door top-down convertible. In the text that we read, the nation of Israel was so enamored with their prosperity that they forgot God. They lost their focus on God. And they become prideful because they're, they are prosperous and they didn't have any enemies. Or if they did have enemies, you know, they were winning in their military campaigns. So they believed that they didn't need God anymore in their lives. And they shut Him out of their lives. They replaced Him with idols called prideful self. Does that sound familiar? Our nation right now, and I grieve because of this. Our nation right now believes that we are self-sufficient. And we believe that we are so prosperous. Proud Canadian people believe that there's nothing in this world that can stop us from doing anything. We replace truth with lies. And so we remove God in our children's classrooms. We take extra care not to offend anyone so that we modify and we tweak, you know, even our national anthem. You, 
you've read of that, of course, I know. We've been singing this national anthem for more than centuries now, and a group of people think it is not gender friendly, and so they tweak it and replace it. We don't care about the sanctity of human lives anymore. As much as God commands us to do it, we demand legislature to pass and make legal the professionally assisted suicide. They just make it, you know, they just sugarcoat it. It's actually killing the sick. And what difference does it make with the one that Hitler did? Killing those who are weak and feeble and sick. Exact same thing. They just called it and called it professionally assisted suicide. Bottom line, we remove God in our lives. By the way, you know what? We're not isolated. Canada is not isolated. Our American neighbors down south has the same path as well. In Oklahoma, there are statues, there is state supreme court, state supreme court of Oklahoma ordered the six foot tall statue of the Ten Commandments to be removed. And this was sanctioned by Washington, by the then Bush administration. And you know what else? They're also changing the phrase, nation under God, in their Pledge of Allegiance. And that motto in the currency in God we trust, they want that removed as well. Good thing we have, have you heard of Jay Solo? He's the one who's very actively fighting against that. Even this, they want removed, you know, all these things. Bottom line again, they wanted God removed in their lives. It's very sad. Now, God knew exactly what was going on, what was going to happen to the nation of Israel. So he sent his prophets. You see, God is faithful. He is good. He does not want anyone to perish. And so he sent his prophet. One of those was Amos. He warned them of their impending disaster. God warned that he's going to take away from them their comfortable houses and told them that he will crush their military might. All their riches and artifacts will be taken and carried away from them. You know, all the gold and all the riches taken, carted away back to Assyria. Why do we wait until God sends disaster to wake us up? In God's great love for us, He will remove anything that will hinder us from seeing Him. If there's anything that's blocking God's view, He will take that out. Because He is good. He will take away anything that blocks our focus on God. He, warn, he warns His people then, and He warns us now still. God's Word, the Bible, is so clear on this. Very clear. Very current. Look up Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. I'll read it to you. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoings and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your, open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such cannot see. Eternal power for instance, and the mystery of divine being. So nobody has a good excuse. can't make an excuse anymore. God is revealing everything to us. What happened was this, verse 21. People knew God exactly perfectly well, but when they didn't treat Him like God, refusing to worship Him, they tribalized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. 
22. They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. 23. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines. You can buy in any roadside stand. So God said, 24, if that's what you want, then that's what you'll get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen, smeared with filth, filthy inside and filthy outside. 25, and all this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshipped the God they had made instead of the God who made them. The God we bless, the God who blesses us. Oh yes, worst follow, 26. Refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women. Men didn't know how to be men. 27. Sexually confused. They abused and defied one another. Women with women. Men with men. All lust, no love. And they paid for it. Oh, how they paid for it. Emptied of God and love. Godless and loveless wretches. 28. Since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. And then all hell break loose. Rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backstabbing. They made life hell on earth with their envy, wanton killing, back stabbing, bickering, cheating. Look at them. Mean-spirited, venomous, fork-tongued, God-bashers, bullies, swaggers, insufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in their way. 31. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. And it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well they're spitting on God's face. And they didn't care. Worse, they hand out prizes for those who do worse things best. See how current this is? This is the word of God written almost 2,000 years ago. It's so current. Men and men exchanging. They don't even know what men and women is now. It's exactly what's happening in our land and in most developed countries today. People indulge in sin and all those acts of lasciviousness and they are proud of it. You know, they even have a special day for it. You know what they call it? Pride parade. And so the Apostle Paul warns us of God's impending judgment. God will use anything, like I said earlier, so we don't lose focus on Him. He will even use the heathen or the unbelievers just so we don't lose sight of Him. He will allow life's difficulties, losing properties, probably losing limb, your ability to see, ability to hear, to speak, to eat, think, or even Lose one of your children to get us back to Him and worship Him alone. And when we go back to Him and repent of our sins, He will move mountains. Remember principle number 10? If necessary, God will move mountains just so our relationship with Him will not be broken. He will do anything to show you His will for you. All you have to do is to what? Trust and obey Him no matter what the circumstances are. Now, what happens to this stiff-necked nation? What happens to hard-hearted people? 
What happens if we refuse to submit to His sovereign will? God will forcefully pry these things off from our hands. And let me warn you, it is going to be very painful. See what happens. What happened to Israel's capital, Samaria? It was totally destroyed in 722 BC. Totally destroyed by Assyria. And this is a historical fact. It's not just in the Bible. You can check Google, check your history books or your encyclopedia if you're old school. Thousands of Israelites were taken captive to Media and Upper Mesopotamia. The rest were made to live under Assyrian rule. And Israel itself ceased to exist. No more Israel. The nation of Israel was blotted out of the map. From there, the land changed hands many times. And Israel did not become a nation again until May 14, 1948 after World War II. This happened only because of God's goodness. Because God wanted to make good of His promise to David and to Abraham. You see, God will not share His glory. He will not share His sovereignty over your life with something else or with someone else. Matthew records what Jesus said in 624. He said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and anything else at the same time. You will have to decide what or who will rule over your life. You may choose to do that later, or you want to do it now, but sooner or later you will have to do it. Whether you like it or not, you will have to surrender whatever it is between you and God, between you and the Lord. Here's the thing, there's good news. No matter what God requires of us to give up, we can be sure that our lives will be so much better without it in the long run. And God says, drop that. Forget about that thing. You're holding on too tightly. For sure, there's a very good reason why He's saying that. He wants His relationship with you to be stronger, more tighter, and it is being hindered by that thing that you're holding on to tightly. As a matter of fact, when God takes away from us what we think is precious from us, He's actually preparing to give us something that is way so much better than what we expect. Something that we did not even think of. Remember Jeremiah 33.3. Hold on to me, I will answer you and show you what great, awesome things you have never thought of. Things that you didn't even imagine will happen to your life, will happen to you because you chose who? God. You chose God. Here's the key. If we keep our eyes on God and not on the blessings, we have to spend time in prayer and we have to ask God to draw us in an intimate communion with Him and to transform our lives so that we can affect the world for the sake of His glorious kingdom. It's not just the blessings. The blessings are bonuses that we receive. The important thing, the key is, we have a relationship with God on a personal level. We know Him like how He should be known. I want to leave you this principle to remember. God loves us so much to allow any notions of self-sufficiency or dependence upon anything other than yourself. So what happens if you hold things too tightly 
we lose it. Let's keep our focus straight on Jesus alone. Paul inspires us to do this. Keep your eyes on the goal. When a runner runs, he can't be looking anywhere else except at the finish line. The goal. Right? Golden State players, they always look at the ball. Uh, not the ball, the goal. Because they wanted to win. They want to make sure that when they let go of the ball, it goes in the goal. Right? So our focus should be straight on Jesus alone. If perhaps you have lost focus on Him and now you hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit to receive Jesus in your life, I pray that you take that offer. If you want, you can recommit yourself. May our lives all be blessed. Because we choose.